So let's try to get a hold of our next speaker, who is Pam Pearson. Is Pam Pearson with us? Yes, I am. Can you hear me all right? We can oh, yes, hear we you. Can. Let us introduce you. And <coughs> Our next keynote speaker is a former U.S. diplomat who in 2006 resigned in protest over changes to U.S. Development, development policies. She has founded the International Cryosphere Climate Initiative. Pam Pearson will talk about, the how, uh, talk about how alarming the situation is. A warm welcome, Pam. And since we know that you speak some Swedish, we have to say welcome. How are you läget? Yeah, thank you so much. It's very nice. Eh, varmt här faktiskt just nu, men vi har fortfarande snö. Men jag undrar, I'm wondering if I should cede to Andreas. He was with us briefly in case he has a difficult connection. No, I, or I, shall I, I go let's, ahead? Let's now go ahead. Go ahead. Let's, okay. uh, let's, let's stay with you. That's, that's go great. Ahead. So, that's great. Pam, uh, okay. the stage is yours. You Right now, Pam. So I am sharing my expected. screen right now. That's great. And are you able to see the slideshow properly? We, we, we can are. see it. Thank you. Okay. Go Excellent. Ahead. And I really appreciated that introduction by Martin because the um, if there are two words I would ask people to take away from uh, today, they would be cryosphere and thresholds. Uh, cryosphere, Martin already defined for you, it means uh, ice and globe. And we really have uh, a climate system that in many ways is determined by the amount of ice we have on the globe. And one could say that the battle against climate change really is the struggle to keep the cryosphere in some sort of a sustainable state. Um, our world's climate really is uh, dominated by ice. And three main messages that are very important as we think about this. First, that cryosphere thresholds aren't determined by an ultimate temperature. They're determined by the peak temperature and by how long we stay at that peak temperature. Um, it's irrelevant how you come back because in order to restore ice, you need to go below freezing one more time. In other words, some of the things that are lost uh, will not return unless we, for some reason, would induce a new ice age. The ice that's in the world right now, much of it was formed during our last ice age. Um, second is that it focused on 2100, which is what our negotiators are focusing on, really misleads and minimizes the cryosphere response. One needs to go over centuries to see that full and inevitable response. Uh, one example that Martin raised in terms of sea level rise, based on today's temperatures, we are going to hit two meters of sea level rise, no matter what. It will take a few centuries to reach, but two meters is now inevitable. So the question before us is how much more than two meters are we willing to live with? And that will be determined by how high the temperature goes in the coming decades. And the third is that our current climate commitments will already cause many thresholds to be crossed, um, especially if an overshoot persists for decades or centuries. But I would also say that there's a growing scientific consensus that even sustained 1.5 degrees is very high risk. And this slide shows you a little bit why, because when we're talking about two degrees of global mean temperatures, in the Arctic, and uh, this is sort of where we are today on the left, um, globally, a two degree mean temperature, as you see, uh, if we manage to reach that, is still about five degrees in the Arctic. Um, the annual mean in the Arctic then is one thing, but the winter mean is another. And here again, you're crossing a threshold of freezing water versus non-freezing water. So in the um, Arctic, if we are at, say, a mean seven degrees during uh, the normal part of the year, that still means 13 degrees above. And we're already seeing peak temperatures like that. There was a period where the Arctic was about 12 degrees over its normal mean just this past uh, February. And when that happens, things melt. 
And you can't freeze them necessarily, again, if you get runoff into the oceans and um, so on. So it is very, very important to pay attention to these irreversible cryosphere feedbacks. The first is permafrost thaw, and I'll run through these very quickly in the limited time we have. The second are the great ice sheets, um, the West Antarctic ice sheets, parts of Greenland. They hold at least 8 to 25 meters of sea level rise. We're not involving East Antarctica at the moment, but that could very easily get involved. And then you're talking about a total of 60 to 70 meters of sea level rise. Um, mountain glaciers are extremely important. We're already at temperatures where we will probably lose most of those. Uh, we can't forget about acidification and eutrophication. Eutrophication is the low oxygen content of water and also Arctic sea ice, which is more reversible. Um, summer sea ice will return in the Arctic at around 1.0 to 1.5 degrees. We still have summer sea ice right now, although it's decreasing, but that involves very, very important feedback, such as some of the extreme weather events, for example, that have been seen in both North America and in Europe during this past winter. Uh, so this is a graphic representation of these cryosphere thresholds and when they start working. So permafrost thaw, for example, is happening today. And one of the key things about this graphic, which we produced for Paris, is that you'll see at the bottom left that says that today's temperature is 0 0.8 degrees higher than pre-industrial. We're already at 1.1 degrees, and that's less than three years later. Things are happening extremely quickly, and there is quite a lot of speculation as to whether we're going to breach 1.5 degrees already by 2030 in about 12 years. Um, going through some of these irreversible uh, dynamics then, uh, again, very quickly, this is the future of the glaciers. And the purple and blue lines at the bottom show what will happen if we manage to constrain warming either to today or a little bit more than that. The red line is business as usual. And you'll notice that both of these go down to zero as we move ahead in the centuries. But there's a big difference between the blue and purple lines and the red one because there the lines are going to zero because melting has ceased and what glaciers remain will be preserved. The red line goes down to zero because at that point we will have lost all of the glaciers. In other words, business of, uh, as usual, other than very high altitudes and very high latitudes, we will lose the glaciers uh, such as at, at, up at uh, Obisco right now where Andreas is, uh, most of the North American West, the tropical glaciers in the Andes are already lost, New Zealand, all around the world in the mid latitudes, those will disappear, they will be very difficult to save. Permafrost loss, we're looking at 30 to 70%. And what's important about this is that once we reach about 4.5 degrees of warming, which we are still headed towards, uh, perhaps even by the end of this century, that will add 125 gigatons of carbon to the atmosphere. That's like adding another China or United States to our carbon budget, and our carbon budget is small enough already. Um, and then finally, on the great, great ice sheets, uh, West Antarctica, as Martin mentioned, may already have tipped. Um, and this is very interesting research that, again, does show that the Weiss, as it's called, is not as stable as thought. And it is extremely irreversible and seems to paleo-historically have gotten involved in sea level rise at about the temperatures where we are today. And this graph, which is obviously very busy, shows why. And what I would ask you to pay, pay attention to is that if you look at these lines, what they're showing from left to right is time moving forward at different levels of temperature. And the very top red and green lines as shown on the screen show uh, temperatures at about the temperatures we have today, not a whole lot higher. Um, and what the researchers tried to do in this case was to try and preserve the West Antarctic ice sheet at different temperatures. The problem was they could not keep it intact. Uh, the only thing that they could influence at the higher temperatures than what we have today was how long the West Antarctic ice sheet took to collapse completely. And at that ranges, as you'll see, from about 150 years on a very, very high warming scale 
uh, we can maybe delay it to 600 or eight to 900 years. But once that collapses, sea level rise can occur relatively quickly and the glaciers behind the ice sheet will then move into the ocean with nothing to stop them over a period of centuries to thousands of years. But the point is it is locked in at that point and that alone is six to nine meters of sea level rise. And finally, this is simply graphically showing what acidification could look like by 2100 on a business as usual scale. And as you can see, the colder waters, which are also some of the richest fisheries in the world, uh, in the northern and southern oceans will be extremely uh, saturated, eutrophied. Uh, it will impact the sea life there. And the scary thing about acidification is it is in some ways the least reversible of all of these dynamics because the, the buffering, in other words, to get us down to a pH where we are today can take 60 to 70,000 years. And if that timescale does not blow your mind, we have had a relatively stable pH in the world's oceans for 35 million years. So we are now playing with a chemistry that has not changed for 35 million years. All of the species virtually that we have today evolved at today's pH. We really don't know how they'll respond to the higher pHs to which we're headed, which again means we need to address CO2 very quickly. So to summarize, one really needs to look to the cryosphere when looking at mitigation pathways, not just peak temperature. What are called overshoot scenarios carry very high risk. Uh, one example, again, from Greenland, paleohistorically, Greenland is unstable at around 1.6 degrees, but that state of irreversible could be reached faster with higher temperatures. So again, the higher we go, the more risk we're taking on. The safest pathways stay below 1.5 degrees, and as Martin said, it's going to be difficult to do that right now without extremely urgent action. Uh, irreversible collapse of the wise is likely between where we are today and maybe 1.5 degrees, much higher though we need to stop. And the, the good news on one level is that there are available paths to, pre to prevent this new climate state, but in order to reach them, we really need deep sustained cuts right now. That's why this we don't have time is absolutely correct. Uh, one of the more promising pathways would combine action on air pollution with CO2 because cryosphere snow and ice reacts very, very strongly to air pollution, believe it or not. And so if we work on both of those at the same time, we'll get sustainable, develop, uh, sustainable development benefits as well. But the most important message I can give you is that the longer we delay, the greater the overshoot, the greater social and societal and environmental costs, and also the lower possible possibility we have for staying below 1.5 degrees or even getting there again. So thank you very much. And um, I, I hope I gave slight amount of hope there at the end. Some scientists are indicating we should make plans to adapt to a four degree hotter world. Business as usual means about four degrees warmer, which is approximately one ice age in the opposite direction. Based on today's temperatures, we are going to hit two meters of sea level rise, no matter what. We are in a race against time. It takes a double whammy to understand. It takes repeated shocks. We need a global movement that demands real change. We don't have time to speculate. We don't have time is absolutely correct. As we know, we don't have time. There's no more time. Yes, we don't have time. We use the hashtag. We don't have time. We don't have much time. We don't have time to wait.